present our work, which is jointly done between uh, Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, Stevens Institute of Technology, uh, Fourth Institute of uh, Computer Science, and Columbia University. Uh, in this work, we also evaluated the defenses uh, discussed by Nicolas and Lucas. Um, uh, essentially, we discussed especially why using the heuristic-based policy to prevent drop attacks is actually hard. So first of all, why is it important to develop new defenses and evaluate them? Uh, various groups have um, reported vulnerabilities and, against, uh, and attacks against the, uh, the latest versions of widely used applications in Windows. And in these attacks, uh, ROP is uh, used to execute uh, code, which is a very powerful uh, exploitation technique. So um, the currently deployed defenses are not enough, uh, which means that we need newer defenses, uh, new defenses to, def to stop the ROP attacks. So promising defense mechanism against the ROP attacks is the control flow integrity. Uh, introduced in 2005 by Abadi and the others. Uh, and this technique, the targets of indirect branching instructions are uh, limited. However, uh, unfortunately, the recent CFI proposals are not uh, strong enough, uh, as we have shown in our previous work. Um, we have particularly shown that an attacker is still able to perform uh, an attack uh, by using the return-oriented programming and color-oriented programming. For more information, you can see our out-of-control out of paper. After evaluating the CFI defenses, uh, we went on to evaluate uh, other promising defenses, particularly ones that uh, are based, uh, that, that inspect the branching history technique. Uh, to access the branching history, uh, the defenses utilize a hardware feature called the last branching, uh, last uh, record branch. Uh, in the Intel processors. Uh, the hardware feature is only accessible from uh, the kernel and records only the last 16 executed branches. Some state-of-the-art proposals, as we have seen, are the key bouncer uh, and Ropecker defenses. And they have very promising pr properties because it's hardware supported. They're transparent. Um, the program does not need to be aware that the defense is in place. The defense does not need any source code or debug code and incurs low performance overhead. Uh, as Lucas discussed, the uh, defenses are essentially based on two pol policies, the CFI policy and the heuristic-based policy. And as we have shown in our previous work, uh, we assume that the CFI policy is broken and focus in stock on the heuristic-based policy. So essentially, we look at what, uh, what the security implications of this policy are. So what is the heuristic-based policy? It essentially uh, relies on two threshold parameters. But um, okay, let, let's see what they are. But first, let's say we have this um, ROP chain that we extracted from the branching history. And to be able to dis distinguish this ROP chain from uh, legitimate code, we need two thresholds, the gadget length threshold and the gadget chain length threshold. Um, <coughs> So uh, the gadget length threshold is used to um, uh, is used by the defenses to uh, check whether the entries in the branching history are uh, gadgets or not. So even legitimate code sequences can be considered as gadgets. So how could we detect this uh, short chain of gadgets? Um, if we if we set gadget length to five all of these uh, code sequences will be considered as gadget by the defense. And uh, setting gadget le chain length to four, um, the, the defense will detect that this uh, rope chain took place. But um, imagine that there were only three rope chains in the branching history and that the branching history check was triggered. Then the chain of gadgets would not be detected so we might be able to uh, set gadget chain length to three, but that's also not easy because uh, if the program itself has a gadget chain length of three, then uh, setting gadget chain length to three actually um, will lead to uh, miscla misclassifications in the program. So a legitimate, uh, co a legitimate code sequence 
might be uh, considered as an attack when you choose the thresholds uh, wrongly. So choosing the thresholds is very difficult. So how should we pick the threshold, the best thresholds? Uh, this is very challenging because an attacker could still evade the thresholds by mixing short gadgets with long, longer gadgets that are longer than the gadget length threshold. Uh, in the previous uh, rope chain example, we set the gadget chain length, the gadget length to five. So an attacker could use gadgets, gadgets that have more than five instructions to evade the, um, the defense. So preferably we want to have the gadget length as large as possible, so the attacker will have to use um, as long gadgets as po possible, and um, the gadget chain length as small as possible, so the attacker will have small space to use short gadgets. But again, uh, setting gadget length too large and the gadget chain length too small can lead to false positives. Um, so they have to be chosen very carefully. And as a side note, we name the long gadgets uh, heuristic breakers. We do not call them long no operation gadgets because they can still be useful. Okay, so let's see what the defenses chose for the thresholds. Uh, because KeyBouncer consults the branching history less often than Ropecker, uh, KeyBouncer is able to restrict, to, to have stricter thresholds, um, as it will see shorter legitimate gadget chain length. So they use different times of checks, and this leads to different thresholds. And, okay. So what are actually the difficulties and challenges that an attacker will face when uh, searching for heuristic breakers? Uh, heuristic breakers may easily use a high number of registers and leave them dirty at the exit of the um, heuristic breaker. Uh, in this case, the attacker will have to use uh, short gadgets to prepare the, the heuristic breaker and restore the state uh, of the registers after the heuristic breaker. The heuristic breaker may also require memory preparations. For example, the heuristic breaker may require a memory location and this has to be prepared uh, before entering the heuristic breaker. Also, it may have a weird, co uh, weird sequence of instructions, which may lead to, um, which may make the heuristic breaker hard to control. So, to show that an attacker can evade the defense defenses by using a heuristic breaker, we developed a uh, real uh, exploit in Internet Explorer that bypasses ASLR, data execution prevention, and key bouncer. Uh, we chose key bouncer because it has, the, it has strict, more, more strict uh, thresholds. And our goal was to execute our injected code. So let's illustrate this. So our goal is to um, execute our injected code, the shell code, uh, but since data execution prevention is in place, we have to call virtual protect to make the shell code executable. And after calling virtual protect, we use some other gadget to redirect control to the shell code. And under the assumption that KeyBouncer was not in place, we would have the following chain of short gadgets. And uh, the, the numbers in the boxes correspond to the number of instructions in the gadget. So, Let's say key bouncer uh, is deployed and uh, is triggered when we call virtual protect. Then it will um, consult the branching history and we'll see eight gadgets in a row. So this means that uh, the, the, thresholds, the, threshold, the thresholds are met and key bouncer will alert the user that an attack uh, was in place. However, the, to bypass key bouncer, an attacker could use a heuristic breaker in the chain. And with the heuristic breaker in the rope chain, the chain of eight gadgets in the uh, branching history would be broken, as we can see in the slide. Um, so 
when the circuit breaker is in place, uh, key bouncer will not detect it because the, ch the length of detectable gadgets is lower than the threshold. And uh, actually, we found many of the heuristic breakers. Uh, so our anal analysis showed that there are many of her possible heuristic breakers in programs. Uh, also in the paper, we have another proof of concept that's more advanced and uses more heuristic breakers. You can see the paper for that. And it actually uh, bypasses a, com a combined defense that includes key bouncer and CC fur. Okay, so a way to stop this attack could be uh, to have uh, stricter thresholds, um, but what are the implications of stricter thresholds to ROP attacks? Are uh, heuristic breakers then still easily usable? For example, if we set gadget chain, gadget chain length to three, then uh, this attack would actually be detected. So let's assume we have the th stricter thresholds. Um, say the gadget length is still 20 and we set the gadget chain length to three. In that case, an attacker will only have, um, will only be able to use at most two gadget, two short gadgets in a row and then he has to use a long gadget. But uh, this brings uh, difficulties for the attacker. For example, um, there might not be enough space to prepare the heuristic breaker and also restore the state after the heuristic breaker. And um, there might also not be enough space to prepare um, a function call after, call after using a heuristic breaker. So um, we evaluated whether we could have such stricter threshold for key bouncer. And for this, we replicated the experiment done by key bouncer and in inspected the legitimate gadget chain length per application. On the, y -axis, on the x axis you can see the detected gadget chain length and on the y axis you can see the number of instances that are detected. And as we can see, um, the maximum detected gadget chain length for Acrobat Reader is five, but for Internet Explorer, if you look at the uh, green line, you see that the maximum detected gadget chain length is Two. So this indicates that you might be able to have stricter thresholds. But still, um, since this experiment is done during runtime, um, there might not be enough uh, uh, code coverage. So um, in other payloads, um, the, the detected gadget chain length might be different, so still more research is needed. As to conclude, choosing the right thresholds for a ROP detection is very difficult because picking the thresholds by inspecting the runtime information uh, lacks coverage, which can easily cause false positives in different workloads. Also, uh, the assumption that long gadgets are not usable, uh, which is assumed by the previous, uh, by the proposed defenses, uh, is broken. And um, the defenses that uh, are broken in this session uh, are published within a time span of one or two years. Uh, this means that they could easily be broken, which indicates that we actually lack tools to evaluate them in a better way. So this calls for new and better tools to evaluate defense against ROP. Thanks for listening, and I would like to take your questions. Please come up to the microphone. Um, so I have one question uh, while we're waiting. Uh, you mentioned in, the, I think in the paper that you might do some analysis of programs in advance to try to figure out what thresholds would work well for them. So to, and you could figure out, for instance, that you need something different for Acrobat and Internet Explorer. Uh, I was also wondering, uh, do you have any thoughts on any other kind of analysis that you could imagine doing in, in advance 
that would make, you could use to enhance the security of a system like KBouncer? Is there any other information it would be useful for that system to have? So maybe you could have um, a, a more advanced heuristic that uses maybe, well, in addition to the gadget length and gadget chain length, also some other properties that are, for example, in the execution path before the uh, API calls. So maybe by using different uh, properties, you could maybe have a more advanced heuristic that. Thanks. Uh, David Williams King, um, University of British Columbia. Um, I guess if we had a stronger CFI implementation, you can imagine having a pretty effective ROP defense. But none of these uh, none of these works seem to consider what would happen if you're dynamically generating code, like with JIT. Can you um, speculate on what a defense against that might even look like? Like, could you could you actually check control flow, or does an entirely new technique need to be proposed? So again, I'm sorry. Um, so even if we have very strong CFI, like the original mm -hmm. CFI work, um, that's not going to defend against um, uh, ROP attacks on automatically generated code, such as inside the, the Java runtime. Um, can you think of what a defense might look like that would actually work in the case of automatically generated code? I have no idea. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I guess that's a question for all of us to answer. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again.